Hello. In this video, we'll consider the partner's limitation on use of flow-through losses from the partnership. Now, in a previous video, we discussed how exactly the limitation occurs. It occurs because the flow-through of a partner's distributive share under Section 704, well, there's various limitations on that. There's three to be specific with respect to the partner, with respect to the partner's flow-through of those losses, I should say. So the first, and this is a waterfall, I meaning it goes in order. So let's say that, that the partnership has a loss for the year, whether it's ordinary capital, whatever, it flows through. Well, that loss first has to be considered with respect to the partner's outside basis, which remember, outside basis means the basis in the partnership interest by the partner. So let's say a loss is $100,000, and it's allocated to the partner. That's, that's the partner's uh, distributive share, that, their portion. And if the partner only has a $30,000 basis, the partner can only take $30,000 of that loss, which will, go, which will then go to the next to, um, step two and step three, or the next two levels of the waterfall. So of the $30,000 loss that, we can take, that can be taken of the $100,000 loss, $70,000 is what's called suspended. It goes into the future until the adjusted basis of the outside basis of the partnership interest has enough to actually recoup it. So maybe in year two, the next year, let's say, the partnership has a lot of income, a million dollars of income, and the partner is allocated, let's say, I don't know, $500,000 of income. Well, then that $70,000 of loss gets to offset that income because the basis now goes up under Section 705. So that's the first step, and that's under Section 704D. We have to look at the basis of the actual partner's outside basis. We have to consider that. Next, we have to consider section 465 at-risk limitation, which the at-risk rules are specific in themselves. And then finally, you have to consider section 469. Again, you have to go down the order. Now, before we jump into the rules of section 465, 469, let me talk about a brief history of why we have 465 and 469. So before the um, 1986, you might have heard this, this phrase. Well, you still hear the phrase today, but the phrase was even more common. And whenever you hear this phrase, you know, tax practitioners, whatnot, they always get this like, <gasps> like, you know, this gasp, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe they're doing that. Tax shelters. Tax shelters before 1986 were very pervasive. They were everywhere. Why? Because if you look at the history of our tax system, our tax rates on ordinary income, before 1986, the tax rates were through the roof. They were higher than 70%. In some years, they were in the 90% range on ordinary income. So then you ask, well, how did people that make ordinary income, like doctors, lawyers, accountants that make a lot of money, how did they not get hit with 90% tax rates or 80 or 70% tax rates? They used tax shelters. That was a main way to minimize your tax liability. How exactly? Well, let me just give you one of the major types. So it was usually done through a limited partnership. So we'd have this partnership, a limited partnership. Remember that a limited partnership, the limited partner has limited liability, but the general partner does not. So a general partner would usually be a corporation because a corporation has limited liability. But the limited partners would generally be people, individual taxpayers, usually individuals, that... They have lots of ordinary income, like physicians. Let's take a physician for a lot. You know, they're making $500,000 a year in ordinary income through their physician practice. Well, they would invest in this limited partnership, which in the limited partnership, there would be non-recourse buildings and land purchased on a non-recourse liability basis. And the partnership would take the deductions. This is one of the, this is one of the huge... Um, concepts in tax law that allows so much is that when you um, purchase a, purchase an asset on a liability basis, you get to start recouping the deductions through things like um, depreciation. So the partnership, the, not, the limited partnership would purchase, let's say a building and land, and they purchase it on a non-recourse basis, and the partnership would start taking the depreciation deductions. And as I mentioned in previous discussions, Partnerships, one of the main advantages of partnerships is that they have extremely flexible tax rules. So one partner would be allocated a bunch of the deductions versus other partners not so much. So 
the physician would invest in this partnership, which would ultimately have losses, and the losses would be allocated to the physician in a way where it would maximize, it would be able to offset the physician's ordinary income. This is through the depreciation deductions, which we consider those losses because a loss is like a deduction, right? And that would offset that $500,000 of ordinary income might get it down to, let's say, $200,000, which might not be taxed at 70%, but it might be taxed at 40%. So basically, through the progressive rates, we'd have a limitation. So that's what Section 465 and 469 did. They came into play in the, in the mid-1980s. They basically put a stop to that kind of idea with the non-recourse deductions. So first is the Section 465 at-risk rules, then Section 469. We will consider those in order. So one thing I want to highlight and, and talk about is you have to look at the individual limits in addition to these. And one individual limit that goes after this discussion is from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. There's a new rule that applies to 2018 onward for tax years 2018 or onward and it says that excess business losses cannot be deducted in the current year and they have to be carried over as a NOL. Now an excess business loss is defined, you look at the business entity, the actual activities of the business entity, you look at the aggregate deductions when they exceed the aggregate income, again from the business entity, plus 500000 if you're married filing joint or 250000 for all other taxpayers. 250000 for all other taxpayers. So really what this is doing is it's saying you can deduct up to, you can deduct the amount of deductions up to aggregate income plus 500000 if you're married filing uh, joint or 250 if you're married filing separate. Because beyond that, it's going to be suspended. It's going to be carried over to the next year under the NOL rules. So really what this is, is it really only allows, after 2018 onward, it only allows deductions of losses from these types of activities, these business activities of $500,000 if you're married filing joint, up to $500,000, or up to $250,000 if you're anyone else. So up to that amount. And anything beyond that is um, considered, uh, carries over to the next year. And you have to continue that analysis and keep going and keep going. It can off, it can offset income. So if you have, you know, $3 million of a loss one year, you only take 500000 and then you have $2.5 million. But the next year you have $3 million in income, you can use that $2.5 million to offset all of it next year. So that's really how it works. It uses, you apply the NO, just like the NOL rules. But if you do have a business that does generate a lot of losses year to year to year to year, then it's possible that um, it's going to take a long time to recoup those um, that loss. And before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, there was no kind of limitation like this. So this does put a huge um, restriction on the ability of pass-through entities like uh, S-corporations and LLCs and even sole proprietorships, flow-through entities, to get a benefit over C-corporations because the loss was trapped in the actual C-corporation and it would have to flow over through the NOL rules. All right, so that's really important to understand is that there's this new um, item here and it does put a severe limitation on uh, partnerships, LLCs, which is what we're talking about here, and it also applies to S-corporations and others. So let's continue with our discussion. And for this discussion, we're going to focus just on Section 465 and 469 because that's very important with respect to the partner's limitations. Very important. There's other issues to worry about, but we're really just going to focus on 465 and 469. So Section 465 is known as the at-risk limitation. I have a checklist here. So this checklist is going to help you determine whether a particular loss is limited by the at-risk limitation rules. So you're looking at this item called at-risk. The idea is that does the taxpayer, the amount, the, the deductions that come off that, the loss that creates the, you know, the deductions that create the loss, right? Does the taxpayer actually have a, you know, are they at risk with respect to the activity? So loss from activity is the first issue. Does the taxpayer have more deductions from a particular activity than income, which create a loss? If they don't have a loss, then obviously you're not considering. So if they do have a loss, 
Then we have to ask, is it an activity which Section 465 applies? Does the loss arise from a business or investment activity? If yes, we continue. If no, Section 465 does not apply, and you're done there. Now, if it is a loss with respect to the investment activity or business, the loss is limited to the amount at risk. And what this has to do with is non-recourse liability financing. That's really the key. And you're going to see there's qualified non-recourse, but that's really the key is non-recourse financing. If there's no non-recourse financing in the, in the situation, you don't have to worry about this. You can go on to Section 469 Passive Activity Rules. But if you do have non-recourse liabilities, you got to drill down. So does the amount of um, loss from the activity exceed the amount by which the taxpayer is at risk? So we're saying that it's possible you can have part of the loss is considered at risk and part is not. So at risk, generally. The at risk amount is generally the taxpayer's um, particular activity from the sum of four things. Cash contributions. So these things are at risk, meaning you can take the loss. So any cash contributions are considered at risk. Property contributions. Amounts borrowed on a recourse basis, and then finally, amounts borrowed on a non-recourse basis to the extent of other pledged assets. So only if there's actual assets pledged. So this one I want to pay attention to because this one is the hardest to understand because the other three, cash contributed, property contributed, non-recourse liabilities, that's, you know, that's all square. But non-recourse um, to the extent of pledged assets, this is the total amount borrowed on a non-recourse basis from a disinterested person for use in the activity, but only to the extent of the net fair market value of the taxpayer's interest in the property, not used in activity that specifically secures the debt. So basically, if the actual property at, at issue is not being attached, it's not, considered non, it's not considered at risk. That's really the issue. So if you do not have any of these four, then the amount is not considered at risk and you cannot take the loss with respect to that activity. So if yes, if you do have at risk, then the loss is deductible only to the extent at which the taxpayer is at risk. Now the excess loss is not deductible in the current year, but does carry forward until the at risk amount goes up, just similar to the basis, the outside basis from the first step of the waterfall of these loss limitations for partners. It's basically you're keeping track of a basis and an at risk limitation, at risk amount. They're two different things. The at risk amount can go up as things are contributed. Let's say you contribute more cash next year or more property next year or you take on more non-recourse liabilities or more, um, uh, you take on, I said non-recourse, sorry. You take on more recourse liabilities or you take on more non-recourse that are secured by assets. If no, then none of the loss can be taken. So that's really the, um, the at-risk rules. That's really the at-risk rules. So going through the waterfall again, let me remind you. We first have to consider the partner's adjusted basis in the partnership. That's the outside basis. If the loss exceeds that amount, well, unfortunately, that portion that exceeds is going to be suspended guaranteed. Once you've determined that amount, then you have to go down the waterfall to the next step, the passive activity. Then you have to ask, well, what amount is at risk? Again, we look at cash contributions, property contributions, recourse liabilities that are at risk to that person, the subject economic risk of loss, and then finally, non-recourse liabilities, but they have to be secured by the asset. Finally, and this even puts a big damper on those, again, that ill phrase, ooh, right, the, um, the tax shelters, was the passive activity loss rules of Section 469. And this is probably one of my favorite provisions of the inter entire Internal Revenue Code because it's a very interesting provision. There's lots of stuff going on here. I'll just give you a, a quick summary in just a few sentences. The idea with Section 469 if you remember back to my example of the physician, the physician, his or her practice, right, was ordinary income, $500,000 of ordinary income. Well, the limited uh, partnership, the idea there is, okay, well, that is from a limited activity, meaning you're, it's a passive activity. Because do you really think that the, um, the physician is actively involved in a real estate limited partnership? No, I don't think so. They are a limited partner, a silent partner. They're just sitting back, they're putting money in, right? And that's really it. So that's really what this is getting at. It's basically saying that we are going to divide up activities into three different groups, three different baskets. We call them baskets. Three different baskets. The first basket is the active basket. The second basket is the passive basket. And the third basket is the portfolio basket. The idea is that any income or losses within the baskets can only offset itself. 
Now you can do multiple activities. It can't just be one. It doesn't have to be just one activity within the basket. You can do all the activities in the basket, but you can only offset losses within a basket, right? Portfolio, um, passive or active with with law, um, income in the same basket, and that's the general rule. So passive activities. So that's the first one. That's really what the issue is here. Did the taxpayer engage in one or more passive activities during the year? And again. That's exactly what we have in our situation, the limited partnership. That physician is not doing, is, this is not active. So you're asking, well, how exactly do I know? I mean, I see that in the, in the limited partnership example. Yeah, I, I know, I understand that the, the, that the, um, that the physician, they're not actively, you know, they don't know, they don't know anything about real estate and they're not actually out there, you know, cleaning toilets at the, you know, at the managing the properties, doing all that stuff, you know, those kind of things. So here's a definition. A passive activity is any activity that involved the conduct of a trader business in which a taxpayer does not materially participate. That's the key phrase, materially participate, or any rental activity not engaged by a taxpayer in the real property business. So I'm not going to go into the specifics of the rental activity because that is its own area. I just want to stick with that materially participate, and I just want to give you some general overview. You're not going to have to know the specifics here. This is a very, very, very fact-intensive area. You might recall from a previous you know, baby tax, um, the hobby loss rules where it's very fact-intensive, Hobby law, hobby versus um, actual business or investment activity, right? Very fact intensive. Same thing here. What does material participation mean? Material participation is a taxpayer materially participates in any activity in which he or she is involved in the operations of the activity on a regular. This is the key language. This is from actual um, the code. Regular, continuous, and substantial basis. You have to you have to have all three. Remember the key language and not or and regular, continuous and substantial basis. The regulations offer objective tests for determining whether a taxpayer materially participates. These are safe harbors. These are seven situations in which the IRS has deemed that these parties, if they do this, they will be considered materially participating. If you don't meet any of these, you can still argue it. These are just safe harbors. A safe harbor in tax means that, okay, these are bright line rules, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you fail the test. That's the difference between a pure bright line rule and a safe harbor. A safe harbor means that if you meet the test, you get it like a bright line rule, but if you don't meet it, you can still argue it subjectively. So the first is participation in activity for more than 500 hours in a taxable year. Second, participation in activity of 500 hours or less, but such participation constitutes, sorry, constitutes, constitutes substantially all participation in the activity by everyone involved. Third, participation in activity for more than 100 hours in a taxable year provided taxpayers' participation equals or exceeds the hours by anyone else in the activity. Fourth, participation for more than 100 hours in taxable year provided taxpayers participation in activity and all other significant participation in the same year totals more than 500 hours. Fifth, material participation activity of, of any five of the 10 taxable years immediately prior. So you can use any of those tests in the previous. Sixth, material participation in activity involving the performance of personal services for any three of the five taxable years. And seven, participation for more than 100 hours in tax year provided that based on all facts and circumstances, taxpayer participates in the activity on a regular continuous and substantial basis. The last one's subjective. That, that one doesn't really need to be in there, it's, it's, but it, that's part of the regs. If you do have material participation, so, so if, if somebody is not materially participating, so yes, then the passive activity loss limitations apply. Section 469 meaning you can only offset your passive losses with your passive income. If no, then you have to consider whether it's active or portfolio, which I'll explain what portfolio is in a moment, but it's probably going to be active. Portfolio deals with interest, dividends, those kind of things. So if you're in the business, I'm not sorry, not the business. If you invest in stock and you trade and whatnot, you could probably, you might be able to argue it's active, but most likely you're dealing with portfolio income. So if you just are, you know, you're not a day trader, but maybe you just own a few shares of Apple stock, right? Google stock, and um, you know you you sell shares, you know maybe once a year, and you make some money off that. Well, that's definitely going to be considered portfolio. Aggregate losses from passive activities. Does the taxpayer have more deductions from all passive activities for the year than all passive income? If yes, then under the passive activity rules, you cannot take all the loss. Again, you postpone it until you have income from the passive activities. If no, the passive activity loss does not apply. So that's really the end of it. There's more rules. What happens if um, you know you only have one passive 
activity, you have losses from it, and then you suspend the activity, you actually get to take the income that year even though you don't have any income. I'm sorry, you actually get to take the losses against other your active income. That's a special rule. So again, I just want to summarize. We're really done with the three. I, this is just a general overview. We're not going into specifics. It can, this can get very, very, very dicey. I just want to give you, again, so let's say I just want to give you an example of how this works. This is where you want to pay attention because you want this is how the interplay is. Let's go back to our example. Let's say a, a, a partnership. Let's call it a limited partnership. Limited partnership allocates a $100,000 loss to a uh, respective partner. Let's say the basis of the partner is $30,000. Right there under the first waterfall, you can only take $30,000 in a loss, but you have to continue. $70,000 is suspended until, again, the basis comes into play. So we take that $30,000 loss. We go to the second part of the loss limitations, the at-risk. Let's say that of the $20,000, I'm sorry, of the $30,000 of the loss that can be taken, right, once you go through the first hurdle or the first waterfall, only $20,000 is considered at risk. You can only take $20,000 and that $10,000 gets postponed until you have at risk amount. And then finally, of that $20,000 left, let's say that all $20,000 of that loss is considered passive. Let me, you're a limited partner. You have to have $20,000 of passive income from possibly another activity from another activity. Let's say you are dealing with other passive um, activities and you have uh, $15,000. That other $5,000 of passive activity loss that you can't take, right, $20,000 uh, total loss for the year passive loss and you have $15,000 in other activities, those are, those are your only activities and for, with respect to passive activities, that $5,000 you can't take, that gets postponed until you have passive income in the future. And that's how it works. You go through it. So this really concludes the loss limitation videos.